One of the most anticipated days on the cycling calendar has finally arrived. An event which has gone on to become the symbol of a region and of a people who show enthusiasm for this sport that is rarely matched. Hello everybody and welcome to De Ronde van Vlaanderen, the Tour of Flanders to you and I. Always a veritable festival of the bicycle and this year celebrating its 100th birthday. Well, we're all set here at the finish line in Udenarda. There have been various events going on around this weekend and uh, amateur women's races too in the professional ranks and of course the men's race which is what we're here to bring you. This is what's gone on over the last few years. Tom Bonin with his three wins in the last ten editions. The top man of the moment. Fabian Cancellara, previous winner and of course a contender today. Stenard de Volder, Balan, the only Italian winner in the last ten years as well. So to the start this morning and uh, it was all getting off in Bruges early morning beautiful city and of course one of the most beautiful days to be on a bicycle it is officially summertime today in Europe the clocks have changed however I can tell you that it was about minus one minus two as people came in and Steve Schenel was attempting to give us his best Petter Sagan <laughs> Well, Peter Jacobs uh, of Top Sport Vlaanderen signing in as well. Always a pro continental team that's well received in these pods for obvious reasons. Well, there's no Philippe Gilbert, but there's uh, Philippe Gilbert's younger brother Jerome, who's running with Accent Wanty. Maxime Von Tom is going to be expected to be active for the Krellen Euphony team. 26 teams to the line today. Movistar have Andrea Amador as uh, their biggest prospect for this race. And a man who is always expected to play good cards and play them well in these styles of races is Matty Breschel of Team Saxo Bank. Well, it was Heinrich House of the Hipster who was signing in a little later on today. He's a man who's shown good form and, of course, shown that he has a pretty sharp tongue during the last week or so. John Dagenkorb, if he can survive plenty of the climbs and keep his big, strong legs intact, then he has an outside chance. Andre Greipel will be working for Lotto and Jürgen Rulens. And, of course, Matt Goss of Orica Greenhedge will be attempting to put Sebastian Langeveld in the right position. Alejit Pataki is here as well. Not a race that he would expect to do too much in, but he's working for Pipo Pozzado. Nicky Dripspur of uh, Omega Former Quick Step. Big, big team here. Without doubt, the team loaded with talent and the most of it. Lars Bohm for Blanco. Greg Van Avermet was also here for BMC Racing, who yesterday announced that Kenneth Evans will return to the Giro. Their focus today firmly on Van Avermet and Tor Hussoft. Johan van Summeren has already shown in his career the capacity to surprise a few people. Bjorn Leukemans having a chat there to Walter van der Holt, the organiser. We talked about Lotto's chances, Jürgen Rolands and Jens de Busserer, who was looking well in uh, Gent Vervelgem before nasty things happened as far as punctures and bad luck for him. And there's the Fellaini of cycling, seeing as we're in Belgium. Yes, it's Blas Yats of Team Netap. Tor Soft, former world champion, slowly getting himself back into form after a horrific 18 months. And Juan Antonio Fletcher, no longer of Sky, now of Vacon Soleil, under pressure to perform in races such as this. Talking of Sky, there's uh, Edvard Boissen Horgan in his Norwegian's champion's jersey. And talking of national champions, former national champion of France is Tommy Vauclair, and ever a man to light up a race. Look out for Sylvain Chavanel until very recently leading the World Tour. And Luca Paolini, victorious in our first cobbled race in Belgium this year, all the way back in the Omloop. Seems an age ago now. Oscar Gatto won in Dvarsdorf London and as well. And talking whilst we've got the Italians all together, there is the man himself. Second last year, Filippo Pozzato, who's since changed teams. Sebastian Langevold for Orica Greenedge, one of the big men in charge of trying to get a result for the Australians today. And Steiner de Volder, twice winner here. Really lost his mojo since moving over to Radio Shack, hoping to refight it. But here we come to the big three favourites. Petter Sagan, unstoppable at the moment. Fabian Cancellara showed that he has the legs of a couple of years ago. This time last year, he was about to have a nasty moment that would ruin his season. And Tom Bonin, well, his winter was ruined. He's had uh, a bit of a worrying build-up, but he's here. He is ready, and we'll see how he gets on. 
So they start this morning at 10 a.m. in Bruges, already for a very long, arduous and extremely difficult day in very cold conditions. You can see not too many cycling shorts on view and you wouldn't blame them. It is absolutely freezing out there. So after the ceremonial start, 100 years of the Tour of Flanders, 1913 to 2013. Only the First World War interrupted this race, so it's the 97th edition today. And as they left Bruges, there were already plenty of people on the sides of the road. That's a real feature of this race, and expect to see it all the way along the 256-kilometre route later on today. Well, let's set that mark, having a chat with uh, Tom Bonin there. And Mark himself, who struggled, much like Bonin, to make this race. A few injuries and an early time for a laugh and a chat for Petter Sagan before the serious stuff would begin later on in the afternoon. That was a new route. We'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment's time. Only the second edition of that route. And as they were off, there were plenty of little early attacks. I can tell you that people such as Andre Greipel and Klaas Lodewijk have tried to get away in the kilometres so far. Not too much happening early on and it all stayed together for quite a while. A couple of early crashes which weren't good at all. Top Sport Vlander and Ryder involved. But the biggest news of the day so far is this. Tom Bonin out of the Tour of Flanders with an early crash. Not good news for Bonin. All of that toe because would he make it, would he not? In the end he did make it to the start line. Unfortunately, he didn't make it very far along the road. Worrying pictures of Tomaka. Three times winner here, of course. And was hoping to put an end to what's been a horrible build-up to the race. It just seems to be that it's not his year. Belgian champion out. And one of the big three favourites out of the running. This is the second monument of the year then. 256 kilometres, 17 Hellingham climbs to overcome, seven additional sections of cobblestones, beautiful Bruges to Oudenaarde. All set for another running of the route that caused such a stir 12 months ago when the famous Kapel Moor was left out for the first time in 30 years. Today we'll see all the main action on the second half of the race, three circuits south of our finish town before a 13 kilometre ride to the line. It's that long straight road where anybody out in front will be a little nervous nervous looking behind them. All famous names, all famous burgs, they're on the Van Vlanderen, the 97th edition is well underway. So underway and let's go live onto the course and sitting beside me Rob Hatch is Jonathan Harris Pass to tell us exactly how things are going out there. Well, as you can see 156 kilometres to go and we have a breakaway. Jetsa Bol, Jakob Rata, Michael Morkov, Tim de Croyer, Kevin Kleis, Lawrence de Vrees and the youngster Tosh van der Sander are the riders who broke away on the first ascent up the Tegenberg. That was our first climb of the day and then they ride on here towards what will be the first of their three loops around Udenard where we are currently sitting now on the finish line so these riders initially pulled away on that climb and they increased their advantage up to around 30 seconds but now it's two minutes and 32 seconds back to the main peloton so a really decent break has been put in here by this collective of seven riders one of the more interesting tweets I've seen uh, earlier today was uh, bone and crashes, 90% of Belgians switch off the television and head to church, it's not too late to celebrate Easter, which I thought was quite good. However, I have a feeling that they will still be entirely focused in on this race. 13 out of the last 30 winners have been non-Belgians. It's still an inordinately dominated race by the Belgians. However, in recent years, they've been enjoying more success than they perhaps did a couple of decades ago. And uh, if you saw that list, of the last 10 winners you'll have noted that there were just three riders in the last 10 years who weren't Belgian but who is going to be the Belgian who who really leads their challenge now with Tom Bonin crashed out of the race that is an interesting question one that many people will be posing to themselves as they watch this race unfold it is of course fascinating once we get onto that circuit at Oudenaarde 
all of the climbs still to come, 16 of them. You can just expect if we do have the main favourites out in front and that this breakaway has been reeled in, that's where you're just going to see them start to drop off. Can Petr Sagan stay with Fabian Cancellara? Cancellara, of course, so impressive in the E3 earlier on this season where he pedalled away to victory. Looking back to the sort of form that he showed here in 2010 when he won the race, of course, and one just wonders whether it will be him or Sagan who comes out on top of this race, or maybe someone that people haven't spoken about quite as much. Sylvain Chavanel is certainly a rider that many people feel is in the right sort of form to have a crack at this one after his uh, victory in the Drie Dags de Pan. He's been on great form, but many people just singled out his performance on that first stage. Even though he didn't win it, Petr Sagan went on and won it. It was the way that he coped with Sagan on the climbs and kept him in check and just made sure he didn't get away and get out in front that just suggests to people that perhaps Sylvain Chavanel could have the best chance from his team. And while well, people were even saying that before Tom Bonin crashed out, so that does make him definitely one of the favourites to, to do well here. Well, plenty of favourites, plenty of names. We will throw them all at you over the next uh, few weeks. Now, just coming into Udenard here, we drove down these streets a little earlier on today. The press parking just to, to the right-hand side where we uh, are in, and then we just walked along these, these streets as well. So they are into Udenard for the very first time. So that is now right into cycling territory. Well, seven riders then in this breakaway, 154 kilometres to go. It is a long, long, long old race today. And as you can see, basically the whole of Flanders is out on the road and enjoying their weekend. Udenarda loves the Ronde, and we do too. I'm sure you do at home. Sit yourselves down and make yourselves very comfortable. As I said, there's plenty to talk about today and plenty to enjoy before we get to the big action. Of course, the action will in main start when they reach that final circuit three times around the circuit that does take in a few different bergs along the way they are varied and the race has only just started really to settle down in terms of this breakaway getting away in the last uh, 20 minutes half an hour or so of course cobblestones through town there nothing too demanding they're not on the official list of cobbled sectors of course Three minutes 12 and it looks as though that the guys in this breakaway have been satisfying those behind that they're not going to cause too much damage at this time well one very interesting name in this breakaway is Tosh van der Sander he makes his Flanders debut today second year as a professional for Lotto Bellisol the 22 year old said that he was naturally delighted to be selected for a race that he's always dreamed about taking part in also joked that he probably won't have time to enjoy it his aim was to get in a breakaway today. He's managed to do that. And the guys here behind him, just letting things settle down, seem to be quite happy with it. There's Andre Greipel at the front radioing back for Lotto Pellisson. Talaferor is on the front of that row too for Garmin. Garmin, one of the teams who I think will be just trying to hope that the race stays together and hope for the best in the final, really. Last year, of course, Rob, the, the race for fourth place did come down to quite a large sprint for the line, and that was something that many people felt would be changed about this year. They felt that the riders would try and attack it harder, the, the Classics riders, because they didn't want to be down in that sort of position where they're coming in towards the finish, and it can still offer an opportunity to the sprinters. They want that to be nullified. And it's a three-man break that eventually came into Udenada across the finish line, um, with Tom Bonin winning, of course, Alessandro Balana, former champion, finishing in third place and people Pozzato finishing in second Pozzato was on extraordinary form at the beginning of last season he'd suffered a broken collarbone back in February and therefore coming into the race people didn't expect him to have any sort of form this year his preparation's been very much better fitness wise but he hasn't really shown the sort of form perhaps that we would have expected and uh, people I think are playing down his chances today just because they don't really expect him to, to have it and they don't expect him to be up there towards the end. I still think he fa he'll fancy himself. And, and the weather conditions perhaps have played into his hands a little bit more. It's not as cold as it has been here in Northern Europe for the last few weeks. And as a consequence, I think there are more riders who are going to be up for this. And, and af after all, it really is the very first classic that we're seeing run properly. I don't want to take anything away from Milan San Remo and from Gent Vevelgem, but Gent Vevelgem was the Gistel Vevelgem. It had a large amount of the kilometres trimmed off the top of it. And uh, the Milan San Remo had that massive bus uh, 
detour, but um, ex I can't think of the word. Um, but, but where they jump on a bus and drive to another day. link, maybe. If I mean that's such a short word, but they, they have have that. Um, in the middle of it so th th these were issues that this race isn't going to have it is going to be run over its full 256 kilometers and as a consequence I, th I think we're going to see our first real racing of the season well it is good to see a complete route being used here in Flanders I don't agree with it it's not cold though it's absolutely free remember it's April tomorrow and it's still about two three degrees it is cold but you're right, the weather is nowhere near as bad as it has been over the last uh, few weeks ago. 151 k's. There are the team buses parked in the main square here in Udenarda. The finish line just uh, to the north of that shot, if you're looking past the church. Just before we get to the bridge that crosses the River Schedel. Biggest river in Belgium. Oh, and we've had a couple of people come to a standstill here. Again, not too much to worry about if you're at the back at the moment. But once they get back onto the climbs, all the main contenders are going to be want to be at the front of the peloton. Again, a bit of concertina in going here, bunching up. And we've already seen Tom Bonin come off his bike and have a crash. We don't want that to happen. And we've already seen, I think it's uh, Ignatius Konovalovas, is it? No, it's not, in fact. It's the new Lithuanian champion for Azure Dozer. And it is, of course, uh, Bagdonas. Gedminas Bagdonas has heard himself there. New signing for Azure Dezer this year. And again, we were just saying, you do not want to get caught up in these uh, nasty little bits of concertinering riders. The road just going a little thin there. This is how it happened. Fran Ventoso lucky to get out the way as well. Andre Greipel again at the front here. Four riders getting away. And even problems for the uh, breakaway group at the back. If you're not quick enough, you will not survive up the front here. Greipel alongside Seaberg. Tosh van der Sander is the lotto presence in the smaller group behind. One Blanco rider as well. So split in the league group. As we come under the Berendries between 7 and 12.3%, it's 940 metres long. First used in 1983 and in every single edition barring 2011 this climb. No cobbles whatsoever. And to the right of the summit here lies an older climb used in the 1960s. That was the Castel Dreyf. And that is now used as the descent from the Berendries leading towards Brackel. One of the fastest sections of the Tour of Flanders coming up. The sin is just 90 metres over an 80 metre distance. It's an 800 metre distance, pardon me. That really would have been fast, 80 over 90 over 80. This group's back together again. Ten seconds now, the difference. Is it going to come back together here, or is there going to be another dot from that group up the front? Get ready, because we might be about to find out. This should be a decent place to launch it. Number 15 there at the back is Hugo Uhl for Agi Dezer. And just look at this, a typical Flandrian sight. The flags flying, the beer adverts everywhere, the beer flowing, and some pretty, pretty vocal people having a wonderful day out at the cycle. And the beer tends to flow quite late on into the evening, doesn't it, Rob, as you experience, especially at Ghent Vevelgate. I remember walking home after the race, back to the hotel. Everybody at Pats was walking in zigzags. It was bizarre. It was absolutely bizarre. There weren't many restaurants open either. It was pretty much a liquid diet for all those back there. So the Berendries, 154 kilometres into the race here. Just over 100 remains on the day. Quick radio back for the Katusha rider, which is Vladimir Sichayev at the back of the peloton there. Just in front of him for Europe car, Damien Gaudin. There's Johan Le Bon who is struggling.
difficulties already then on our sixth of the 17 Hellingen and climbs there's a heck of a lot worse to come it's been a measured response though from Radio Shack which I think is pleasing a lot of their fans out there delighted to see that the team are actually putting in some really good work for Fabian Cancellara because too often one would have to say in the last couple of seasons Cancellara has had to do it all himself it's, it's his style but he needs the support in this part of the race before all the main actions gonna happen he needs to be able to rest conserve energy And of course it's a good reaction to some bad news for Radio Shack because of course there's been very very strong rumours stroke confirmation on uh, the backhand from some of the riders that the team is going to fold at the end of the year. Cantillar himself at the moment rumoured to be off to IM Cycling when his contract expires at the end of the year. Having his win in E3. Horses attack on the Udekvarnamont might be planning on doing the same here today fifteen seconds the difference at the moment just a section of those riders remain again splitting into two groups and once more it's Lotto driving the pace Seberg and Greipel is really burying himself So once more a fracturing of the group. 101k still remain. Guys hanging on for dear life here at the back. I am cycling. And in the meantime, a problem there for a Lamprey rider. Certainly better happening now than a little later on into the course. Once you get on that section with all the Quartamonts and the three circuits around town here in Ildenarda, and that's when real problems would start now the remnants of that breakaway group those who really couldn't hold with a lot hold on with the lotto riders at the back there I should say the two lotto riders as there were three in the front group Greipel and Seberg that is Tosh van der Sanders reabsorbed so there's now six riders up the front and for the first time a bit of presence from Cannondale Flick of the arm, it's Radio Shack are required to come and share out the work. Martin Chalingi still up there for Blanco. Now Vladimir Isaishev has had a mechanical pulling off here. And now back out in front and looks like is it Francis Dejeu coming up on the outside there to join? Oh, we shall see. This is Blackall. 19 seconds of difference. Chalingi and Yetsa Ball both in this group. Kwiatowski, Greipel, Seberg and De Vries. So Blanco and Lotto both with two members involved here. Again, it's all building up and it's all quite clear I think that it's going to be what we expected the order the first time round is one of the, the big moves are, the first big moves are going to be made yeah absolutely they've managed to easily deal with that first climb over the second after the Reckelberg but Andres and then from there the Valkenberg and then it is uh, generally quite relaxed passage through to the Udekvaramont but from then on in it is very hard and fast that the climbs come so Radio Shack with that one solitary presence from Cannondale continuing to set the speed up on the outside so the Valkenberg is approaching for the uh, breakaway riders 
160 kilometers into the race. No cobbles on it. 30 seconds is the lead. We're getting on race radar. 29, I know you can see on that graphic on your screen there, the head of the race. Andre Greifel at the front. Again. Flicks his arm, wants Kwiatowski to come through and help him again. Looks around as a bottle goes flying behind. So the Valkenburg climbing from 53 meters from 45 meters to 98 above sea level. Maximum of 15% gradient. First climbed all the way back in 1959 on Deronda. Now just pulling that lead along again at the moment. Lotto just attempting to stretch it out. Greipel is finding life slightly harder here on the Valkenberg but as you can see the crowds out in force once again this climb will tick off number eight of the 17 that they have to take on so almost halfway through on the on the climbs here and this one one of the tougher ones that they have to take on as Rob was just explaining to you harsh gradients on the way up and straight away you see the gears slipping straight down and we have a break off the front here of the main peloton from Saxo. Well, little advance. Being followed straight away by the Movie Star Man. Saxo brought uh, a stronger team than we've seen in the other cobble races. He brought Jonathan Cantwell here. He was so good last weekend in the Criterium Internationale. Rika Green Edge as well getting involved. So more men throwing their hats into the ring. Climb crowned finally as says an expression of pain there. 103 at the back is Elia Favilli for Lampre. Again, no cobblestones here, so a little less taxing in, in that respect. But look how stretched out the peloton is now. 31 seconds the difference between the brake and this mass of riders behind. Remember, there's an extra team this year, 26 teams. UCI giving its approval after uh, Katusha were belatedly granted a World Tour license by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Katusha hadn't actually been invited to this race but in thanks to their World Tour license. So Jose Joaquim Rojas Hill, Stuart O'Grady and Anders Lund. Three riders, oh dear. Skyrider down here, one of the Blanco men down as well. The man to go down for Sky. Gabriel Rash is, is the man on the floor. The former Norwegian champion. 36 from uh, Rabobank is set Van Mark and that is not good news. Set Van Mark down. One of the men that you could have put an outside bet on today. It's the wrong time in the race for something to happen to him. The question is, will he get back on his back? Jerome Cousin, the other rider that's involved. Bad, bad news, particularly for Blanco there. In the meantime, Jose Joaquim Rojas. unhappy this is how the little uh, coming together happened and that's how it was avoided clumsy not good at all rash was the first man back on his bike for sky so expect him to get back into the peloton here but now we have uh, a bit of a respite from the main climbing around 20 kilometers in between climbs here before they hit the Uduk Faramont. And that is where we expect this race to really start to blow up. Kvyatovsky, Ball, Chalingi, Greipel. 
Seberg and De Vreza are the six riders with a 30 second advantage ahead of the second group. Three counter attacking riders of Rojas, O'Grady, and Anders Lut. Wow, Frank, what do you got? Gophers or something? No, I. So, on to the Koppenberg. Maximum of 22%. This one gets really nasty. Was actually excluded for a few years following an accident between the Commissaire's car and a rider back in the 1980s, but it's brought back in 2002. A maximum of 25% once you get inside the bend here. Again, the steep banks it makes it a little more difficult for the spectators to get involved. But there's been no shortage of the Lion of Flanders looking down on them. Flags placed just about everywhere. And look at this. Look how steep, look how horrible this gets. The cobbles aren't in the greatest condition here either. They're old, they're a bit more bobbly, a couple out of place. And you really have to try and pick a line. This is a beast of a climb. Andre Greipel is immediately feeling the burn here. He's beginning to drop out the back as perhaps you'd expect him to, as is his teammate. Keeping strong out in front though. Also Seberg, the man just in front of him. Feared by many this climb. First race back in 76. Always positioned a little too far from the finish to actually decide the race. But I can guarantee that there is still plenty of pain felt as they're ascending. They've gone through the hardest part now. But now it's the Peloton's turn. And this is going to get interesting. Was it just still up there, which is impressive again for Astana? Marcus Burkhart looks as though he's the BMC rider, just positioned in second there. Burkhart's been involved in a few breakaways so far this year. Nothing too decisive. They hit the steepest part of the gradient up here on the Koppenberg. And now time to find out who's really suffering and who has the bit between the teeth. BMC looking good, they have bodies to the front here. You're right, Thomas is the most advanced sky rider. Slowly chongs his way up. There's Cancellara, problems already as well behind. Vacon Soleil getting involved. Oh, once you've stopped there on the steeper spot. Look, he can't even get any traction on his bike. Get off and walk for a while. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. It's pretty horrible out there. And many riders employing the same tactic. Sagan is one of them. Well, no real option there for any of the riders. Once the Vacuum Soleil rider cut across the middle, it brought everyone to a stop. And when you stop on that steepest part, there is no way to get the traction to get going again. So they've all had to come off and walk up this bit, which I bet some of them are quite relieved about. But the ones who are the main protagonists are going to be distraught about this because they're going to lose time and they're going to lose ground. Lose time, lose ground. Well, if you're a professional cyclist, you have to get off and walk. You're losing a bit of pride as well dear oh dear oh dear this is horrid stuff still 64 kilometers from the line now Ashi Dozer leading them over Vakal Soleil thankfully for them it wasn't Juan Antonio Fletcher who was involved in uh, that bit of nervous uh, riding Thomas Cancellara Sagan just out the way of it Steiner Vandenberg there and these are the remnants of what happened Oscar Gato there's Ladagnu. Oh, and the more problems. Picky Turps run out. No wonder that camera's flashing. Well, we were saying that he'd been quite far back down the peloton here. He needs to be up the front on these climbs. Surely knows and surely well experienced enough to know that now. You would have hoped so, but unfortunately that is the state of play here over the top of the Koppenberg it has never really been decisive in the race overall although if you go back to 77 there was an occasion there where Freddie Martin switched bikes on the Koppenberg and was ordered to pull out by the race director but then he helped Roger de Vlemink up to the top of it stay on his bike and helped him across the finish line allegedly for 150,000 francs nothing's been proven there um, but Martins was viewed by the Belgian public as the moral winner of the race that year. 
and there is even a cobblestone to that effect in the museum. So I, a rather lovely story as Terpstra finally makes his way over the summit of the Koppenberg. Just proves that if somebody gets their gears wrong up front, somebody just loses control a little and you are stuck behind, the race can turn very quickly sour. Nicky Terpstra now has work to do to make sure he's up the front. That's Stewie O'Grady battling his way on. Now the big presence of Goudin coming through there at the back and after putting all of that speed and pressure on the front of the peloton earlier on today he does look like a bit of a spent force out the back. In the meantime, oblivious to all that at the front are five breakaway riders Kwiatowski, Chalingi, Greipel, Seaburg and De Vreza. Two riders from Lotto who have to be the strongest place team at the moment. Don't have to do any chasing. Just make sure they're in the right place at the right time. So that Jürgen Rolands and Jens de Bussere can take advantage. If it all, or I should say when it all comes together again. Now getting reports as well that Ian Stannard was one of those riders caught up in that uh, little traffic jam on the Paddenberg. I should say the Koppenberg, pardon me. Shouldn't have too much effect on the riders. That little pause that they had to have on the Koppenberg. But what it will do is force them to have to expend that little bit of extra energy that they perhaps weren't anticipating whilst they try and close the gap here on these breakaway riders. So, very disappointing thing to have and to happen as they come into the second feet zone. Fabian Cancellara, beware. This time last year, a fall in this feed zone meant that he was on his way home with a broken collarbone. The most innocuous of injuries and incidents. Andre Greipel didn't take too much food on there. Something straight into the pockets, the musette goes flying. That's a nice souvenir for somebody. Kwiatowski, one minute ten by the way, the gap back to the peloton. And this is right on cue, the peloton that roll through off the descent of the Koppenberg. Themselves now going towards the second feed station. After that, it will be up to the Maria Borrostrat, which is the penultimate flat sector of cobblestones. The thing here, <laughs> food has to be taken on, but there's almost no time to think about it. Have to keep concentrating on the race as well. Around 60 riders in this first part of the peloton. And that is the group that the winner's going to come from. One imagines. I'm just looking around. Doesn't look like Ian Stannard's managed to get himself back in. There's Sara Montins in, uh, in what a long way off looks a similar jersey, but it's actually, of course, the Latvian Championship jersey at the bottom left of your screen. Really good representation from BMC. They've got five riders at least in this lead group and when you consider that they were a team who who came into this race under a bit of a cloud because of Philippe Gilbert being unable to compete and Taylor Finney not being here either it's it's good to see such a massive presence from their team at the moment in this lead group of 60. Well Daniel Oss in that group bad news for BMC is that Toru Soft isn't so Daniel Oss and Greg Van Avermet would suddenly become men to look out for. Kwiatowski, Chalingi, De Vreza, Greipel up there alongside Seaburg. Onto the Greisberg, 2.5 kilometers long between the 5 and 8 yeah. percent. No cobbles on this one. No, once again not one of the harder climbs that they have to take on today but it is just a telling climb of because of where it occurs in the race and okay it's not over the cobbles but the riders this stage as you've said Rob they've taken on over 200 kilometers already and uh, it's really gonna be burning and it's just a question now of, of really putting your head down and going to the finish guys have had their head down for quite a long time riders uh, up the road with Mina and Selvaggi really stuck in no man's land there I'm afraid Problems for Radio Shack and problems for Steiner de Volden. Front wheel for him. Just before a climb, not great time for it to happen. 
So two of their main men have had mechanical problems in the last couple of kilometres or so. Cancellara successfully oh. negotiated his problem. Defolded with took them all out the car and looking on. Off and on his way as quickly as possible again. I wonder if he'll get the magic spanner treatment on the way back as well. We shall see. This is the story though with uh, Selvaggia Mina in the deep base of your shot. Desperately trying to get back on. And they do look tired. Said it once or twice, I make no apologies for saying it again because it is plain for us all to see. And what we do know about this race this year is that we're not going to see a piece of history made as you take a look at the front there with Peter Sagan just nicely nestled in towards the front, the exact position he would have wanted to be in approaching the final two circuits that they're going to take round the Oude Kvavermont and the Patagem as well. So that will be perfectly suited to Sagan what someone really needs to do to beat him I feel is take him on early and, and go for it but I we'll have to wait and see but th this race we were waiting to see if anyone could stop Tom Bonin if Bonin could manage to pick up that fourth victory become the first ever man to do so there are five riders including Bonin who've won it three times, Sashiel Bus, the first man to do it, then Fiorenzo Magni, Eric Lehmann and Johan Museo. Museo is one of the biggest fans of this race and he just comes back every year to, to look on and watch it and he loves everything about what it asks of the riders, although he is one of the riders out there who is critical of the new course, but still. Is that not just a case of, oh, it wasn't like that in my day though? Well, you, you often wonder, there seems to be a fairly popular statement from, from Belgian cyclists, ex-Belgian cyclists. Now, here we go. Efforts coming out the front again with I Am Cycling. Just behind him, Ladagnou, who's ridden well for uh, Francaise Desjeux very, very well over the last couple of weeks. I Am, of course, we saw Eric Halsford towards the back of that peloton there. Just, uh, using a couple of more of their men in reserve as you see Hausler coming in still towards the back of the peloton yeah. 42 there is Marcus Berghardt you definitely have to say that so far this race has played entirely into the hands of the favourites at the moment there have been no overly aggressive attacks made on the opening climbs and you always felt it was going to be really stark the actual decision making as to who was going to come across the line first was going to start on the second attack on the Udik Favamot Sarah Montins and Arno de Mar, pardon me Ladagnou uh, still further back so Arno de Mar, it's pretty surprising that de Mar is up there actually he has been riding well but fair play to him to stick uh, over 200 kilometers over all those bergs Chapeau and he's a rider that could be very interesting here alongside Selvaggio's up the front and is he going to carry on his dig? Quick conversation with uh, Kwiatowski Still the two lotto riders hang on Andre Greipel gripping the coattails pretty desperately there Good news for De Volder, he's back in. Again, just about the right time. I don't want to leave it too much longer now. So this good, is good news there as well for Fran Ventoso rejoining the back of the peloton after he'd managed to, to get back in there after his little altercation with the front wheel. How strong is Hayden Ralston here? He's putting in a wonderful performance. Masjid Bodnar on his wheel. We saw Bodnar a week ago in Gent Vevelgen with all that work being done. In the meantime, Arnaud de Mar. And Alexei Salamontins attempted to get away. Ventoso is after his team car. 
Yet another man who I'm pretty surprised is still around with us. Now it's Bodnar on the front. Again, a scene we saw seven days ago on the way into Vevelgem. Yeah, many people have been critical of uh, Peter Sagan's team, saying that Cannondale didn't possess a team strong enough to, to really put together a decent challenge for Sagan here. That's being proved wrong yet again. They've been involved and they're doing enough. Tommy Verkler sitting in there as well at the moment. Whereas out in front, as things currently stand, this breakaway of seven riders now can look to push the pace along a little more. You'll see the main peloton swing into view any second now. That's the the difference between them. Just 31 seconds or 32 seconds the advantage as things currently stand as they approach what will be their second loop around the the very tricky climbs of the Udek Favamont and the Paterberg. 46 kilometers still left to run. Andre Greipel has been doing so much work out of the front. And really fantastic to see one of the most notable sprinters in the world at the moment doing all of this work for his team out of the front and dragging the pace along again. And that group, which was of around 60 riders, I would say has been whittled down to around 50 now, setting off in pursuit. A couple of the Lotto men taking the the route round the back of the trucks and then coming back out onto the front to try and push the pace along once more. And a nice little conversation going on out at the front of the group about who should uh, take on the lion's share of, of pace setting here but they're just managing to hold it still at 33 seconds and that chasing group definitely has lost around 10 riders I would say and we can imagine and foresee that that's just going to increase in casualties anyway as they take on the final 45 k's well, we're on to the uh, Tour of Flanders Street now as it's nicely known the road that's named after the race still Hayden Ralston at the front good to see Argos Shimano getting involved as well. Roland nicely well positioned for Lotto. Same with Jens de Bussele. But it's Bodnar. Really, really putting down the work now. So Francesco Faili as well for Vinnie Fantini. Oh, and Vini Fantini having problems. Two problems. One of which uh, is Oscar Gatto. And what a cruel, cruel time to get a back wheel puncture. All thanks to his teammate that it's being sorted out. I think that's uh, Francesco Kiki, is it? With him. Gatto is back on his bike. Gatto is up the front, well positioned, just as we were saying. Thankfully, his teammate was alert. The man protecting him in the front. Very, very quick, quick thinking. It was from Kevin Holtzmans, in fact, the Belgian rider for Vini Fantini. So well done to him. But it's going to be hard work here for Oscar Gatto. And again, more energy that he really didn't need to expend. News of an abandon coming through, and it is Alessandro Petacchi, Alijet, only making it 200 and odd kilometres in. Not one for him today. Question is that, has he done enough work, and has he put Pipo Pozzato in a place he needs to be in? We're getting a quick view of Pipo there, so that's your answer. Pozzato, nicely positioned, he's another who's been quiet today. Not always easy to spot when they've got those uh, black winter jackets on as well over those nice and easy to spot pink jerseys 
Geraint Thomas looking comfortable very comfortable in fact for Sky well, so many wondered whether this would be Sky's emergence in the classics Geraint Thomas had a really good finish here a couple of years ago well, he's concentrated on the track as well for the last couple of years I think he's happier in his own approach this year in that his own focus is the road he's enjoying that he feels good and he says he's climbing with ease again the proof of the putting will be in the eating won't it? it will be because they've got the four toughest climbs really to come now the ones which really will take it out of the legs and it's going to be there that the decisive moves i think will be made it's coming up now the next time that they go up on the Uda Kvavama, I think we're likely to see one of the big guns at least lay down the gauntlets to his uh, main rivals for the title here. Lots of jostling for position here now. Lots of jostling for position. Uda Kvavama coming up next. Comes 219 kilometers into the race, the second time around. Remember, it's the hill that Fabian Cancellara used as a springboard the other week in E3. A couple of riders taking the long way around. There is Sarah Montins back in the group. Cancellara knows the climb inside out. Don't be surprised if he puts the hammer down I would say I'm more on the final loop here at the moment the, the way things are looking it's still a long way out we shall see might yet choose to surprise us and attack somewhere else all depends on how the race is going good for a light hearted moment there between two of the riders at the front still finding time for a chat this again a little lull here they have the breakaway just 22 seconds ahead of them no real reason to do anything other than conserve a bit of energy here and just roll on. Tom Avercler gets rid of his arm warmers there. Another sign that he might be ready for battle. Eva Bossenhagen. Good to see Iglinski back in. And again, look out, Bozic, still for me, looking very strong. And we know that he has a turn of pace. He might be a good bet for a podium today. Well, one of the riders that I definitely noted down in the, in the ride-up to the uh, to today, Sagan Cancellara, Chavanel, we've already spoken about. The standard looks as though his chances are blown. Garan Thomas is still in there. Borat Bozic, though, is there. Van Avermaet is there. Bozzato is there. Rollins is there. Paolini, I have Paolini got caught back I'm afraid I think Paolini and his chances for the moment are done Alexander Kristoff still there which is uh, good news for them another of those northern lights from Norway he helps from Stavanger on the west coast there's Fletcher as we mentioned position on the left hand side in the meantime the breakaway are on their way up Oh, the Clarnamont for the second of three times. Things started to really heat up last year when Set Van Mark made an acceleration. He shelled out many a rider from the back, and a couple from the own breakaway here have been shelled back towards the peloton. It's actually Marcel Seberg, and it's not Andre Greipel. He's going like an absolute machine. But look at this. It's all going to come together again very soon. Remember, this is a long old climb, one and a half kilometers over cobbles now. Kwiatowski, the strongest of the breakaway riders at the moment. Selvaggi's up there with him. So while Selvaggi's there, you don't expect uh, Fletcher to do too much. He might be able to wait. 26 seconds the difference, but changing all the time. Rolston now looking suddenly tired at the back of that group, and who can blame him? meantime one man who should be absolutely tired out is Andre Greipel but he's still going strong in the meantime Seberg at the back is doing zigzags yep. Lion 
Seaberg looks as though he's pretty much sitting up and allowing himself to be caught by the the chasing a peloton now Tom Claire was desperately trying to get through behind one for him soon stuck quite a few riders back there's Sagan Christoph in there as well Vandenberg Chavanel Thomas has been caught quite a way down the peloton And there's uh, Hayden Ralston content to drift a little further back. Tactics of control here from Radio Shack are being well employed and for me they're not being tested anywhere near enough. I think a few more beers have gone down since we were last here. The singing's got that little bit louder. Imagine what it's going to be like on the third circuit. Time for another round before then. So the rolls of work pass as you see a couple of Icorinhas, the Basque flags flying. Remember, to the Basque country begins tomorrow. That the build up to Paris Roubaix next weekend. Those football fans of you. Looks as though those Basque supporters were athletic club fans. They had the club emblem, the Bilbao emblem, emblazoned on the Icorinha, which is by the way the Basque name for the national flag. Sagan, superbly placed still for me. Just riding on that inside. As Kwiatowski he is now in a break of three alongside Greipel and Selvaggi. Greipel's hung on brilliantly here. They're off the cobbles for the moment. Peloton still firmly on them behind. This is difficult for Seaburg and the Germans valiant attack which has lasted in the breakaway for quite a while is over for now imagine his race is a question of just drifting and drifting and attempting to finish now waits to be caught by those behind gets the top of the Udukvara mod at least So it's all about really having the courage to make the attack here. A lot of people frightened of getting caught, of course, afterwards. It's so difficult to approach tactically. Hence the reason strength in numbers, if you're a team, is the best way to go. If you're a team that maybe only has one or one and a half, two possibilities, you can understand why you want to keep it together. 36 Ks to go. Next up is the Paterberg for the second of uh, three passages and look at this the hammers being put down behind now Lotto again taking on the work each of the team tactics starts to be implement implemented bottom Sylvain Chavanel quickly oh there's a rider down and it's a sky rider it's Geraint Thomas who's hit the deck looks as though it'll be okay to carry on but that's not what Geraint Thomas needed Sky had the Boisson Horgan best position and look at this out the front work being done by BMC no waiting going on here Sky with problems for Geraint Thomas who desperately needs to get back on his bike I wonder if he's going to get any teammates to help him back up here this is how it happened Thomas hitting the deck and going down in a mass of bodies there the only rider to hit the floor I was just about to say that the Paterberg is the Sufferberg. We're approaching that again. Some riders suffering before we even get there. It's been extraordinary how many of the riders that we've seen who've come off have been riders that we've been proposing as potential winners of this event because, okay, they have to be in it, but it's been very few riders who have been unaffected 
by issues have been the ones who you think, oh, well, it doesn't really matter if they're affected by an issue or not. I mean, Garan Thomas was a genuine chance for Sky, and it's going to be really hard for him now. Cancellara's had a problem as well. His probably happened early enough for it not to have too major an impact on his hopes for winning here. Oscar Gatto, though, was looking so good, and he suffers a, a puncture as well. Just poor timing for Thomas's crash, just as the pace was being put on. Thomas goes down and really didn't help his cause. Not too much showing from the Omega Farmer quick step due to the fact that Kwiatowski is still up there. He presses his uh, earbud to his ear to try and hear some instructions on the race radio. No, it's certainly not going to be his team who are doing any of the work at the front and they don't need to which is another very clever move from them as far as Sylvain Chavanel is concerned because it means that he's able to conserve his energy for a possible attack later on. Well, Fletcher back in the group a moment ago but just as an illustration of how conservative this is being raced at the minute Luca Paolini back in as well how often have you seen big favourites have problems like Fletcher and Paolini have had today and get back onto the end of a select group. I certainly can't remember it. Very rare indeed. This is a little bizarre. Omega Farmer now do come to the front of the peloton. The numbers though still have been whittled down. I wouldn't say there's more than about 50 riders in this second group. Now but now's the time to stop hiding. Now is the time with Uda Kvaramont and Paderberg coming up to make moves. 33 seconds back to this group now. Not quite any belief in them, I'm sure, just yet. But if people keep marking out each other, if people keep racing to a ridiculous conservative level, then they'll be happier. Now, a mega former quick step suddenly. You saw Kwiatowski listening in on his earpiece a moment ago. An order has gone out, and it's time to chase them down. Vandenberg and Chavanel. And now that Fletcher's back, hey, guess what? Vacon Soleil are doing some work. This is a pretty bizarre race so far. Garant Thomas is back as well. We're getting reports. So all of those riders that we thought were probably done and dusted for a chance, and they might well be with the energy they've had to expend to get back on, but they are back on. Uh, what could happen? We could have a, a bizarrely big group contesting the finish here. We're not used to that in the Tour of Flanders at all. We're talking very, very small arrivals. Vandenberg onto a small section of cobbles. Only 50 metres or so long. Kwiatowski in conversation at the front. Just eased off the pace as his teammates have continued to up it behind. So that means that Eno and Rulants have stayed out in front. So hung out to dry a little. Now their companions in the breakaway. When that figure hits 17 kilometres to go, that will be the final ascent up the Udek Favamot. And I'm so surprised that we're not seeing the peloton reel them back in before that, because I would have just expected that to be the position for the, for the attacks, the decisive attacks to be made. There is a small bit of road between uh, Udek Favamot and Paderberg where uh, you can gobble up a few of these riders if you like. Sagan in position towards the front. Cancellara doesn't want to miss out. Right inside of your shot as you look at it. On a very, very tight corner there. It's a corner that they've uh, been on several times on today's race. Okay, waiting for an image of people Pozzado in there. We haven't heard anything to suggest he might not be in the group. And certainly we've talked about the fact that people have been managing to get on who had been dropped. Roland and Inu are the men up front at the moment. The lone remnants of the breakaway that's taken on several different forms today, as you'd expect. Getting reports as well that Luca Paolini is very, very close suddenly to the front of the peloton. 
Again, it'll have been a man to watch today, but if the racing had done its proper job and all the big favourites had shown themselves, then Paulini would be out of it by now. If he wins, they've only got themselves to blame. Cancellara also getting himself in an interesting position now. All problems back for Vini Fantini. Front wheel change. That's not Oscar Gatto again, is it? There is Paolini, right in the middle of your shot. White Giro helmet on. This time it's not Paolini. That, in fact, to Kevin Holzman's Belgian rider of Vini Fantini. An ally for Oscar Gatto. No more than that, really. So here we go. Ure Quadamont time for the final time. And on his own is Jürgen Rolitz. Sagan here ran out of power last year whilst attempting to chase down Alessandro Balan, who'd already made a move. Did recover and managed to bridge the gap with some strong acceleration on the next climb. Has he learned his lessons here? That's the question. 2.2 kilometers of cobbled climbing, the Ude Quaramont. Maximum 11%. It's as steady as you go climb, really, for the ones in this race. Third and final time, and it is the penultimate climb of the race. Ino followed up by Kwiatowski. There's Turgo in the green of the Europe car. Juan Ofrido just behind him for Francaise Desjeu. And look who's leading them up here, Petter Sagan. Right at the front of the peloton as they climb up behind. Now, here goes Cancellara, maybe. Sagan right on his wheel. And this is where Cancellara might just attempt to ride away from them. That is certainly what is happening. Cancellara putting down the hammer and being willed on by the many supporters at the side of the road. He's already bridging the gap to Alfredo, but so far, Sagan is staying with him. As is Steiner Vandenberg and Edvard Bois in Horgen. Langeveld not too far behind. This is interesting here, Cancellara stepping up the gas now. He knows this climb well. This is exactly where he rode away in the E3 Hardelbecker a week ago. I should say nine days ago, pardon me. Sagan right on his wheel and he's not letting Cancellara out of his sight. Finally, the attack has happened and this is suddenly stunning stuff at the Tour of Flanders. Well, finally, we have a race on our hands here, and Fabian Cancellara really is trying absolutely everything. Roland is out in front, he's over the top, and he's going to be finding his way back down towards the Paderberg in just a few moments' time. But we have Cancellara just soldiering on here up against Sagan, and Sagan is finding it relatively easy by the looks of things at the moment to hang on to his coattails. Well, they're on what's sort of a false flat at the moment. Kwiatowski stayed with them. Cancellara flicks his arms. Sagan is not going to do any work for Cancellara. I'm pretty sure about that. Looks around. Sagan does, in fact, come in front of Cancellara. That's interesting. Of course, it is in Sagan's interest to stay with him. If those two do get away and stay the line, there's only one winner. It's whether Cancellara can get away. Wonderful work. Real fighting spirit by Sagan. Learn his lesson, remember, from last year. We were asking, would that be the case? Made sure he had the power here. He was stronger on the Paderberg. And look at Kwiatowski again. What a ride this is from him. Hanging on for dear life in this group of three. Still climbing here. Stands erected on the side of buildings. Just fitting as many people as possible as they can into this uh, outside arena. Cancellara still there, Sagan just about on his wheel. So just three seconds behind the main group at the moment. Fertowski has finally gone. And where the rest of the favourites, none of them with these two guys. Will there be a counter-attack on the Paderberg? That's the question. Something has to happen now. There's only one ramp left. And Cancellara will be a little worried that he wasn't able to distance himself from Sagan there, I think. Well, it might have a little concern, but he's going to have another chance to have a go at him on the Paderberg. It's only short. 
But he's got he's got to eke out an advantage there. That is an absolute must for Fabian Cancellara if he's going to win this race. Rollins. He's in a good position himself as well. And finally, you can see just further down the road, we've been watching all the action at the front, but the race is starting to break up again further down. Cancellara. Just at the top of the Uruquaramon. Sagan going with him, zigzagging away. They won't want to let Roland slide off either. He's a dangerous customer. And this is a group of deluxe proportions up at the front. Fabian Cancellara, Peter Sagan and Jürgen Rolands at the head of the race. Rolands is waiting for them. He knows there is no use in riding off on his own here. So three of them in a group together, leading the race with 16 k's to go. One climb remains, that is the Paderberg, a third and final ascent of the icon of Belgian cycling, the last climb of the day, and it is a bit of a leg buster. Just extraordinary how easily Cancellara and Sagan have managed to pull themselves away from the rest of those favourites. It was a devastating, devastating attack. Again, we saw all those big boys getting back into the group. Nothing of a counter-attack so far. Now that Kwiatowski's gone, will we see Chavanel? And the answer to your question is on your screen now. Chavanel and Vandenberg getting involved. Eval Boisenhagen at the back for Sky once again. It's looking like it's not going to pay off for them. Uh, each race goes by and goes by, no results for them yet. Will they have to rethink this uh, whole Tenerife training thing? We shall see. Good pace being used here. They get ever closer to the pit again. Questions that are being posed about that particular climb now, of course, are whether Petr Sagan can stay on Fabian Cancellara's wheel when they go into it. Only the Paterberg remains to make the difference. Sagan finally started working for Cancellara again. Only one favourite here, and that's the man in the middle, the big pre-race favourite. And they're approaching the Paderberg. One right turn up here. You can see the crowd already on the hill as it rises. It's only 360 meters long. There are huge gradients here. And this time last year, Sagan was the strongest. He doesn't need to ride away though here. It's Cancellara, the man who needs to put in a leg busting attack. And this is where the race could well be decided. The lion of Flanders flags roar them up the Paderburg. This is where Sagan kicked 12 months ago. If he goes again here, will anybody be able to follow him? But I don't think he needs to. It's all the pressure on Cancellara. However, further behind, evidence that the race could still yet come back together. And we might be about to see for one of the first time in Flanders history, some version of a mass sprint, which would be rather bizarre. The Swiss fans out in force here to try and bay Fabian Cacciolar up the Paderberg. Puts down another gear, tries to pull away. Sagan is out of his seat, just hanging on, but Cancellara has eked out a small advantage. He's managed to get him off his wheel at least, but I think Sagan's done enough up there. It's certainly taken its toll on the Slovak though. You just look at him there, and Cancellara has made a difference there. Sagan's going backwards, and Cancellara pulls away. Cancellara has it then. Now then, we have a race on our hands. It's a question of a few seconds. I don't think it's anywhere near enough, by the way. But we shall see. He has that little bit of a gap that he likes, and he now has to ride for his life towards the line. Six seconds on Pérez again, and suddenly there is something. There is a race. 
there's a difference between the two riders. Sagan holding on and holding on. The last 50 metres or so was where he just cracked. Now it's recovery and catch Cancellara, the aim of the game for Pettis Sagan. Cancellara on the left-hand side of your picture. Sagan just behind him, a matter of seconds behind him on the right. 12 seconds now and Cancellara has made the difference. Now this is where he becomes so, so difficult to catch. Sagan second in San Remo. Second in E3 Harlbecker to Cancellara as well. Although the winning margin there was pretty much more spectacular. Good news for Sagan is that he has company. But we all know about Cancellara's time trialing abilities. If he gets into the groove here, then there's something wrong as far as uh, the rest of the field is concerned because it's going to be almost impossible to catch him. Well, Sagan there just screaming for Rollins to come and help him out. And uh, he's done that, but look already. Cancellar put the hammer down. He's managed to draw it up to 17 seconds now. And if there is anyone who can start a sprint 12 kilometres out, that's Fabian Cancellara. Fabian Cancellara then said before today Spartacus won, Terminator won, the battle of the Knicks names, Cancellara won, Sagan won, that translates at, at the moment, Cancellara one and a half I think. I do have a problem with the nickname Spartacus I want to add, I mean I just think it's ridiculous, I mean the Terminator I can understand, that is a good nickname but Spartacus is just a ridiculous nickname for a bike rider. It's not as though he's led a slave's revolt against the Roman Empire, he's a bike rider. You tell him that. He's a bit stronger than me. Did he self-name himself? That's even worse. Still, outstanding performance. Don't want to take anything away. Fabian Cancellara is looking back to his best. People who said he was never going to win another Classic again, he proved them wrong by winning the Semi-Classic E3. Is he going to prove them even more wrong here by winning yet another monument? This will be his second victory in the Ronde van Vlaanderen, and this will be by far the more epic. 27 seconds now, 28, look Tong out, it's hurting him, but he can stand it. He's been here before and he's looking extremely strong now. Sagan and Rulant, it looks as though they're going to be fighting out for the podium. I can almost tell you which way it's going to go right now. Sagan, a bit of a broken man at the top of that hill there. Now it's a long, long straight drag all the way into the finish. Vandenberg and Chavanel made moves, but I'm afraid a lot of the moves were made a little late today. Well, people want to people want to, 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 to take away from what the course offers, then they should just look at the state right now of the race with 10 kilometers to go. You're, you're upset. Oh, this isn't the, the Ronde van Vlaanderen that I remember from the days of yore. Well, things change. And the way this has changed is changed for the better because this is making the extraordinary spectacle of seeing one of the most promising riders of a generation, Peter Sagan, destroyed by an older campaigner. Well, again, tactical mistakes. Sagan might want to think about to around five minutes ago when he, he agreed to start working with Cancellara. Helped him all the way up to the Baderberg and then was destroyed on it. Sagan perhaps had to be a little more, bit more stronger mentally and tactically that we shall see how it plays out but to me it all looks like it's game over I think 34 seconds and unless Cancellara suddenly implodes don't see any reason why he will do it is his Ronde von Vlanderen it was a perfect timed attack for Cancellara and once I think he just had a little glimpse over his shoulder when he saw that Sagan came off his wheel he also saw that Sagan was broken and he was broken at the top of that climb he lost it completely and he had to get himself back together and Cancellara just went straight down as soon as he hit the flat we're talking about a 10 kilometer time trial and well there are very few in the business who are any good at 10 kilometer time trials in the same vein as Fabian Cancellara. Paolini here leading the charge to try and close and bridge the gap on Sagan. Now that is possibly Sagan's best opportunity of still gaining victory is by getting more people involved in the pull. But they've only got eight kilometers. Well, Sagan 
flicking his arm, trying to get Roland through. Roland isn't stupid. He's not going to make the same mistakes as Sagan did. He'll do very little work, the minimum, I'm sure, because if he's going to lead Sagan to the line, he knows Sagan's going to beat him. All about tactics here and using your intelligence. Cancellara has done that all game. He's had his team protect him fantastically, I have to say, all day. Radio Shack have put in, they've certainly surprised me. I'll put my hands up quite happily and say, I had you completely wrong. I thought that he was going to lack support today. They have been nothing short of brilliant. Having said that, could they have been tested more? I think many would agree. Well, you just have to hear what Bernie Eisel was saying at the start, apparently, that about the fact that they'd need to go early. No one did go early. No one really put on the pressure. The only team, and people said they were mad for doing it, but the only team that actually tried to inject some pace into this race earlier on were Urupka, and they just got lambasted for doing so by cycling fans, questioning what on earth that they were thinking of doing. Well, at least they were trying to stretch the legs of Cancellara and Sagan early on, but when it came down to it, Sagan was the only person who could stay with Cancellara, and he could only stay with him for a short while. No one else could deal with it. They didn't try and break the riders early enough. Well, Cancellara on course for a magnificent win here. Just as 2012 was Tom Bonin's year, could 2013 be dominated by this man? We shall see. He already won at E3, which is the mini Tour of Flanders. He's certainly striding on to what should be another wonderful lift of a trophy here today and a proud stand on the top of one of the most famous podia in world sport. And in seven days' time, well, it's the uh, not so little matter of Barry Rube. Well, 2010, he did the double. No reason why he can't do it again here in 2013. He's on that sort of form. Has, of course, won Barry Rube one previous time back in 2006 as well. But Fabian Cancellara is looking so graceful at the moment. He has. One of the most dubious, I think, accolades attributed to him as well, which is he is the rider in the world who's held the yellow jersey for the most days on the Tour de France without ever actually having won the title. Well, we all know that's because he usually scoops up the prologue of the time trial at the start. Hence the reason why a sprinter hasn't worn it for donkey's years. That should all change next year, though. Tour de France will go to Yorkshire with a sprint stage to start, some might naughtily say. And they might be right that it's been designed for Mark Cavendish. Well. 6K still to go. But it's uh, the adopted Swiss Flandrian here, who has many a fan in this part of the world due to the type of rider that he is. Continuing into the finish, I can tell you that at the finish line, a few of uh, the riders who had dropped out a little earlier on in the course have just crossed the line instead of getting to the broom wagon. Asan Basayev, one of them, just sneaking through. So Cancellara is not going to be the first rider across the finish line. I hope that, that doesn't upset our timing system too. <laughs> oh, do I? I don't think we'll need them though, because Cancellara is going to have such a margin of victory. Well over 30 seconds ahead of Sagan and Rolands. Petter Sagan, again, is going to left to wonder that it's, whether it's just his lack of tactical knowledge and youth. Just a quite phenomenal performance again though from Fabian Cancellara and a perfectly executed plan. The only, only hope Sagan would have had is if he could have held on to him for another 10 metres and you just can't believe that after the beast of a season that Sagan's been having so far that he couldn't find that little bit of extra energy but he was just a broken man and that speed was quite phenomenal from Fabian Cancinara and the speed that he's now producing out on the course is phenomenal too. Well, I've just seen a photograph passed to us by one of our commentary colleagues in the box here that's just been taken of the motorbike that we briefly saw on screen. It's a screenshot that's been taken. Cancellaro, when he went away there, was doing 50 kilometers per hour, wind against, into a headwind. An absolutely wonderful performance. As the rest of these guys, blown away, know that there was nothing that they could do about it. Certainly on that last wall, the attacks had to have been made earlier on. Four Ks to go. In the meantime, we are watching the race for the podium spots. Oscar Gato at the back there. Right next to Juan Alfredo. 
Paulini just in front of them. Oh, and it looks as though it's another flat tyre for Gatto. He's not had too much luck today. Four Ks to go for Cancellara. And look at all these people on the road to welcome him into Udenarda. In fact, the Tour of Flanders Museum is here in Udenarda. And I think uh, that his face, his photograph, his victory salute today will be added to the numerous collection of memorabilia that is uh, already stocking the walls and shelves of that temple of Belgian cycling. Already a chance for an early celebration here. Quick chat with the car. Just saying, well, Fabian, you've more or less done it here. Just keep going like you are. And this is a victory lap for him, really, now. It is. I mean, he needs to keep his head down and keep the speed up. But, yes, it is a victory lap for Fabian Cancellara. And a deserved one as well because he has, yet again, timed things to perfection. And just can't take away how much this was indicated in his performance in the E3 Harlebecca that you uh, commentated on Rob because it, it was just there for all to see wasn't it that performance you you wondered if Sagan would not fall for the same trick twice but Sagan was in that race and he saw him do it but even close to the top of the Paderberg then when we saw Cancellara make his move who would have imagined that he'd so quickly get a gap of 30 seconds it, it was the acceleration over the top and away from the moor shouldn't call it the moor not to confuse it with the famous moor that was taken out of the race but over the top of the Paderberg of course that really made the difference look at this now one minute ten this is absolutely incredible I mean Roland Sagan looking round at each other saying did that just really happen Ab they must be as, 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 as amazed as we are one minute ten it's a quite incredible amount to have got out as he heads towards the final couple of kilometres now. And there's a literal flam rouge hanging underneath the last one kilometre. That's fantastic to see. But Fabian Cancellara looks so smooth. He is one of the most elegant riders out there at the moment. And once again, he has torn up one of the monuments and made it look ever so easy whilst defeating a very, very strong strong field and I mean, we look there at Oscar Gatto picking up another flat and you think oh bad luck for him but you know what it wouldn't have made any difference whatsoever in the outcome of this race there's no way that Gatto would have been up here living with Cancellara and you have to take on board as well Cancellara had a flat had to have a replaced tyre 50 kilometres from the finish as well and we said at the time look it probably won't make too much of a difference towards him just because he's got a bit of a flat section before the second ascent up the Udakava mod and ultimately it's proved to have no effect whatsoever it was the perfect time if you're going to have a bit of bad luck to have it head buried into the handlebars from Fabian Cancellara the Swiss star really is back this year 2012 to forget certainly this race this time last year is in hospital already recovering from a broken collarbone 2013 for him has proved to be very very lucky so far so this the view all the way into the line Udenarda as Cancellara approaches the one kilometre to go banner under the flam rouge the red kite that indicates there's just one to go and now it is surely celebration time rests his arms on the handlebars and he can afford to really enjoy this now several thousand people packing the grandstands here all ready to stand to salute after this exhibition on the top of the Paderberg yes many will say he wasn't tested enough throughout the race many will say that his team had an easy ride here I thought personally they were absolutely magnificent and Cantillada has come on to take the fruits of it 500 meters to go for Fabian Cantillada who can now sit up very soon and start to enjoy the moment finally allowing himself a look over his shoulder to see just how far behind his main challenges are and I don't think he'll even believe it when he looks back Cancellara then into the final 250 metres finally starts to slow up out on the pedals stretch out a look behind 
Look at the difference. Celebration with Dirk De Maul in the car. And look at this. Fabian Cancellara thanks his lucky stars, but I can tell you can thank his team and himself for a devastating acceleration on the top of the Paderberg. Because after six hours, five minutes, Cancellara wins the Tour of Flanders for yet another time. The favourite of most people, this new route, but it certainly has provided a different spectacle today. As we look once again at uh, the difference in World Tour points, that seemed to be a little error on the graphic last time. It looked as though Sagan had twice the number of points of Fabian Cancellara, so I'll correct that to you. And Fabian Cancellara now not exactly on the coattails of Pedro Sagan, around 60 points behind. Let's take a look back at the day then as Tom Bonin was uh, dropped from the race and taken to hospital very early on following a pretty innocuous but nasty crash. Good news is he's had some stitches in his knee and it's nothing too much more serious than that. As the racing got going, a few early attacks uh, started. Andre Greipel was active throughout the day. A more heroic domestic performance we've seen from him. And then we start to see, started to see, I should say, the first evidence of Radio Shack control at the front of the peloton. Riders such as Seberg, Van der Sander and uh, Greipel went for Lotto. But Radio Shack stuck around their leader, helped him out and made sure he was safe all day long. Some riders who weren't safe, one which was Sepp van Mott. We didn't see him too much more active after this crash. And once the real Hellingen started, there was all sorts of problems in the pellets. And a big split here that left the likes of Stannard, Paulini and a few other big names uh, out of contact. Some even having to carry the bike cyclocross style. I'm not sure it's what they had in plan as uh, the start of the day arose this morning. Nicky Turps for another of those big names cut back out. Once the racing settled down again, it was a group of around 50 riders who would contest the final three circuits around Udenarda. Back on Soleil had their own problems with uh, Fletcher. And Fabian Cancellara himself would even have a puncture. But before they got to the main ascent of uh, Uda Quaramont, it was good work from his teammate Steiner de Volde to pull him back up the front. And tireless work from Hayden Ralston all afternoon long to help him out too. Two punctures along the day for poor old Oscar Gato put paid to his efforts and a wonderful ride from Mikhail Kwiatowski almost made him into a very very happy man at the end of the day. Another man to hit the deck, Geraint Thomas shaking his head as he was put out of contention but bizarrely in what looked to be quite conservative racing as we got to the final two ascents Riders such as Paulini, Thomas and Fletcher were allowed back onto the end of the group. A breakaway that was still away ahead contained Selvaggi and Kwiatowski. And Jürgen Rolands decided to join them. This would prove to be a decisive move for him as he would then end up on the podium. Sebastian Eno briefly with him but then dropped nice and quickly. Once Cancellara and Sagan made their own moves, it was uh, on the Uduk Kvarabon where Cancellara was followed all the way by the Slovakian national champion. But it was when they got to the Paderberg for the third and final time that Sagan started to lose a little bit of traction underneath himself. The power deserted him and then we saw an absolute exhibition, an explosion of power from Fabian Cancellara who then rode away to have over a minute advantage to the line. Sagan then got a little frustrated with Rollins, but that was all secondary as Cancellara rode over the line. Plenty of time to celebrate in what was his second win on this race in his career. From Udenada, from John Harris, Pass and myself, Rob Hatch. It's been a delight to be with you this afternoon. We'll see you next time on Flanders Classics. Thanks for joining us, and we leave you the news that Cancellara wins Tour of Flanders on its 100th birthday. Thank you.